incredible work that you have done over the course of this year. Um, I wanted to say to our small businesses and um, to our businesses in general, um, help is here. And you have borne the brunt so much of this pandemic and of this challenging year, but um, we want you to know you will hear about some resources today that will uh, hopefully help you as we transition. I, my themes this, this, this year are recover, rebuild, and restore. And that's what this is really about. And so we hope that you will be able to get some good information, some good takeaways, everything from the expanded PPP to the disaster loans to how we're helping the smallest of small businesses and our restaurants um, as well. We, as your delegation, are here to help and um, just so proud that we were able to work on and pass and be in support of our President Joe Biden's American Rescue Plan. Thanks so much. And I'll turn it back over to my incredible colleagues. And thanks again, SBA. Thank you to all of the lenders, the SBD, the, the uh, well, I, I'm going to go through all these names, but you'll hear about them as you go throughout the day. Thank you, and we're here to help. Thanks, Congresswoman. I'm going to hand it over to my uh, colleague, friend, and senior Senator uh, Tom Carper. Um, just uh, an opening welcome and thanks to the county chamber, the chambers of commerce uh, from across our state, from up and down our state, uh, and other Delawareans who are joining us. Um, we're going to hear mostly from the SBA, from John Fleming, the SBA director here for the state of Delaware, and from Blanche Jackson of, Jackson of Stepping Stones. Um, but at first, uh, just some brief opening remarks from Senator Carper, then I'll make a few remarks, and then we'll get to the main presentation, and then to your questions. Senator yeah, Carper. Thank yeah, thank you, Chris. I, I want to thank Chris. Chris is uh, a uh, very senior member of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, the appropriators, uh, in order for us to fund programs like this, the appropriators have to appropriate. And Chris is an appropriate, he's pretty darn good at it. And his priorities are good as well. So Chris, uh, well done there. He's also a senior member of the uh, Small Business Committee in the, in the Senate. And we put those two together to have a, uh, a fellow from Delaware who's uh, in a great position on the approach committee, great position on the Small Business Committee. He, uh, you would expect to uh, have a really good results and, and we have. And thank you for you and your, st your staff, Chris, for just doing a great job on, on this. We have one person in the house to, to handle all of the work of two, two guys in the Senate. And that's Lisa. She does a terrific job, and she's a member of the, uh, the Energy and uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, which is a huge committee, maybe the most important committee in in the uh, in the, the the House. And we're grateful to be uh, her her wingman in all of this. Uh, kudos to to our, our to our friends at the, the SBA. Uh, when uh, when the, when all hell broke loose, when the, something hit the fan, uh, you guys had to stand up enormously. And in order to, uh, to to do the work with PPP and a million other things, and I just want to thank you for for your great uh, great great work, John Fleming, and the folks that uh, that work with you. Abraham Lincoln was uh, was once asked rhetorically, "What is the role of government?" And he said, "The role of government is to do for the people what they cannot do for themselves." Uh, fortunately, we don't have pandemics uh, every uh, every so often. We do have a lot of the flu every year, new uh, new uh, uh, breed of that to react to a, a pandemic like this about every hundred years so far. And we've had to race to try to catch up and to be able to right the ship and to help our businesses to survive and get kids back in school and, and so forth. A, bit, a significant piece of this package that the, uh, the American Rescue Plan that, that we're going to talk a bit about here today, significant piece of it is vaccinations. Vaccinations. When Joe Biden was on the, the day before he was inaugurated, uh, we had a sort of going away uh, farewell from the, the National Guard headquarters in, in Newcastle. And I talked to him a little bit and I just said to him, I said, the, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, the main thing is to get people vaccinated. And that is a, a major role of the federal government working with uh, our pharmaceutical companies, including AstraZeneca and a bunch of, of, of others. We got to get uh, as many people vaccinated as quickly as we can, effectively as we can. And uh, what that's, uh, I think we had about 4 million people that had been vaccinated before January started. I think we're about uh, maybe 15 times that now and heading toward much, much higher numbers. We got to get uh, all kinds of people vaccinated, but also including uh, teachers. We got to get our schools open. There's an opening up more and more. We got to get kids in our schools so that parents can um, know that they can go to work and uh, not have to worry about the, what's going on with their kids. The, uh, the, uh, we've continued to make uh, adjustments to PPP. We've got an influx of extra money, a little bit of stretch out on the, the, uh, the timeline for applications to try to be responsive to the, the demands and the needs from, from our businesses up and down the state. But we are, we're here to help. 
been uh, in, in adversity lies opportunity, and I'm just uh, uh, grateful for 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 everybody that's been part of making that make helping us through a very very tough uh, period of time. Situations like this, pandemics like this, uh, terrible recessions like this, 9/11s like this, they uh, they can either divide us or unite us. And what we need is to be united. And when we're united, we're stronger. And under the leadership of our new uh, new president, I feel uh, united and stronger than ever. Thank you so much. Welcome everybody. And Karen McGrath, thank you. Uh, my wife just gave me a note. It says, make sure, Martha is right here, says, make sure you're off mute. <laughs> so it's nice to have someone right here telling me what to do every minute of the day. <laughs> uh, great to see you all. God bless. We'll get through this together. Thanks, TC. Um, our core focus today is the American Rescue Plan. Um, the American Rescue Plan is what our state and our country need most at this moment. And um, throughout the pandemic, um, through last year and this year, small business owners in Delaware um, have been working to preserve jobs in our community. Um, the ARP, the American Rescue Plan, delivers emergency grants, uh, more lending, more investment, uh, particularly in hard hit small businesses and nonprofits that'll help them uh, to both retain and to hire folks. Uh, it puts the full force of the federal government uh, behind ending the pandemic and helping our state recover. There's two programs I've particularly uh, fought hard for. Uh, one is a revival of the State Small Business Credit Initiative or the SSBCI. Uh, there's $10 billion in the American Rescue Plan for this. I was an original co-sponsor of the bill. Um, and it's something that uh, back in the 0809 financial crisis, an identical program uh, Delaware used successfully uh, to lend to 110 businesses. There's also a specific program in the American Rescue Plan called the Restaurants Act. Uh, there's $25 billion in there um, that'll be specifically given out to help sustain or revive restaurants. Um, and I am grateful for the support of the Delaware Restaurant Association and folks uh, who've been advocates for this bill, um, like Chef Aiken from Le Cavalier, who I understand is on. Um, states are gonna get you know, funds um, and so will localities. There's about 1.3 billion. Uh, in this bill overall for the state of Delaware. And there will also be some important state and local programs um, that'll add to what's being done uh, through the SBA. Um, we've also refined uh, the PPP program um, so that there are some uh, newly eligible businesses, maybe brand new businesses that um, weren't eligible for the initial PPP. We're trying to focus on um, very small and very hard hit businesses, in particular minority owned businesses. Uh, and this additional expanded program for restaurants. Um, the intention is that we'll make sure that there's resources uh, for them. Um, at the end of the year, we're also going to be doing appropriations that um, should be able to help. Um, I've got a lot of other text here, but I'm frankly just going to move on uh, to introducing Blanche Jackson, who's the CEO of Stepping Stones Community Federal Credit Union. Um, Blanche is here to talk directly um, about how pandemic-related federal funding through um, organizations called Community Development Financial Institutions, um, like um, Stepping Stones, um, has benefited small business. Um, her small CDFI in Wilmington uh, did about 1.6 million uh, in PPP loans in the first round and about 1.5 million in the second so far. Um, they've issued loans as small as $5,000 for a very small business and as large as 700,000 for a nonprofit. So like so many other lenders across our state, um, Blanche rose to the occasion to make sure no one was left behind. Blanche, great to have you join us today, and I look forward to your comments. Thank you, Senator Coons. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Carper, Senator Coons, and I know Representative Blunt Rochester had to um, lead the call. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share how the American Rescue Plan Act, and more specifically the Paycheck Protection Program, impacted our credit union and small businesses in the city of Wilmington. Stepping Stones Community Federal Credit Union is a CDFI and an MDI who serve the residents and businesses in the city of Wilmington. We are 3.8 million in assets and the smallest credit union in Delaware. When the American Rescue Plan Act was passed, we made a conscious decision to participate in this round to help nonprofits, small businesses, and Schedule C filers gain access to PPP funding. One of the greatest changes that we saw and had the most impact in this round of funding was to allow Schedule C filers to use their gross income instead of net income. This change provided an opportunity for many more sole proprietors to qualify for PPP and begin to have funds to save their businesses. Another notable change was to the application process. 
During this round, the SBA took a more proactive role in reviewing the applications, <clears throat> excuse me, that were submitted, and we were notified of any discrepancies ahead of time. I think this was a good change because it should remove some of the applicant issues that could develop at, develop at the time of forgiveness. With the enactment of the American Rescue Plan, we immediately contacted the nonprofits that we had worked with in earlier rounds to share the rules of being able to apply for a second draw. <clears throat> Excuse me, and most of them qualified and applied. We also contacted over 60 small businesses by telephone to inform them about PPP as well. We were successful in helping those that were interested in applying. And I'll just uh, reiterate the numbers that Senator Coons gave you. So as of today, we process loans for a total of 19 small businesses and nonprofits for a total of 1.5 million. There were 10 small businesses and nine nonprofits. Of that amount of money, the largest loan that we processed was 676,000 and the smallest was 7,000. Nine of the loans were less than 20,000, six were less than 50,000, two less than 150,000, and only two over 300,000. The other thing that was very helpful for us was the creation of the PPP liquidity fund by the Federal Reserve. It allowed us to pledge our loans for liquidity. So for a small credit union like ours, it allowed us to provide more loans to businesses that were in need. So I believe the PPP program provided much needed financial assistance to the small businesses and nonprofits that I work with within the city of Wilmington. And I am extremely proud that Stepping Stones was able to support them. Thank you. Thanks, Blanche. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to John Fleming, uh, our fearless leader uh, of the SBA district office uh, here in Delaware. Um, let me just briefly make a little clearer something I didn't uh, finish covering before. Um, there's several different pots of resources and of support for small businesses uh, in our state and across the country. One that John's going to principally talk about is the PPP or the Paycheck Prioritization Program uh, loans. There have been two rounds. Uh, the most recent extension through the ARP is through um, June of this year, June 30 of 20. 21, and there have been more than 7,500 loans to Delaware businesses since that program was renewed and extended in December. EIDLs, or Emergency Impact Disaster Loans, um, remain available today, and John will talk about that, and the Employee Retention Tax Credit, um, something extended through December of this year uh, by the ARP, and then the funding to CDFIs like Stepping Stones that I referenced uh, earlier. Um, I should clarify some things I mentioned in passing before are areas that we still have work to do in. So if you happen to be from a business um, that is ineligible for the PPP because of when you got started, uh, or if you work in a sector uh, like gyms or fitness facilities um, that hasn't yet gotten any sector specific relief, um, we hear you and we'd love to keep hearing from you to make sure that we understand uh, what are the areas, what are the hardest hit segments like travel, the travel industry and travel businesses have been particularly hard hit. Um, we look forward uh, to hearing from you um, and to understanding um, how um, some of the special programs we've just funded for entertainment venues and for restaurants are going to get unfolded. Um, we are so blessed today to have John Fleming join us. Uh, he and the SBA team here in Delaware jumped in with both feet uh, as we when we passed the CARES Act just over a year ago. It was $2.3 trillion worth of uh, relief and support. Uh, and it, we asked the SBA staff uh, to do one of the biggest expansions of their activity in their history. Um, and in particular, to do loans that become grants and include nonprofits as well as for-profit businesses, a significant expansion. Um, and they had to partner with a lot of our lenders here in Delaware, uh, who all were just uh, terrific about this. That initial rollout for the PPP certainly had its challenges as the SBA federally was writing the rules as the SBA locally here in Delaware was trying to implement it. Um, and I just wanna thank John and his whole team for how hard they worked, how dedicated they are and have been uh, and introduce him and thank him uh, for being a part of today's comments. John. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, we got an echo. I think, I think you should mute. Okay. I know it's true. Yeah. 
Did that do it? No. Is anyone else on this call who's in the room? Better? No. There we go. I just left Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that did it. Um, well, welcome everyone. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. And, and of course, thank you to the entire delegation. Uh, uh, Senator Coons invited me to come to his office and uh, we're in the same room, but we're both fully vaccinated. So it's all good. Um, and, uh, you know, as you've got the history on PPP, uh, rolling out, it's been, it's just been an amazing ride to try to help small business people. And, um, just to give you some of the numbers that we were going through and how much we had to change, um, you know, on average SBA will maybe do 150,000, maybe 200,000 loans a year. That includes disaster. Um, just last year we took in, uh, 14 million idle applications as well as another 6 million, um, uh, in PPP loans. So um, we created departments where they weren't there um, and processes with, that didn't exist before legislation came out. And, um, but, uh, you know, they did not forget us. They gave us extra money for extra people and we hired uh, close to 5,000 extra temporary workers to, uh, to get this done. So um, we're still working through the process. Uh, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not been easy for some of the bugs. But one of the things I say to anyone that will listen that this program actually gets better every time they make changes to it. And a lot of those changes are what just uh, Senator Coons just said is, is letting him know, letting him know if there's anything we need to do to make changes to make it better for you and your businesses that you uh, see. And, um, and, and I think we've all seen that. Um, it may take a little bit of a process, but it certainly has worked well. Um, I'm gonna ask Jim Provo to run a few slides for me uh, Jim, you want to bring that up? Yeah, we're just going to do a few slides because I want to spend as much, as much time as we can on uh, your questions. Um, so there's a, a pre-COVID picture of me before I decided to grow the COVID beard. Um, I see a couple of people out there joining me, but um, uh, it, goes, it goes through some of the stuff. The next slide, Jim, I wanted to show my staff uh, real quick, Jim. There you go. Uh, these, these are the individuals that I need to give credit to. Uh, John Banks, uh, Ellen Herbert, Jen Pilcher, Jim Provo, and Mike Rossi. They are the ones that make this program work for us here in Delaware. Um, so feel free to contact us in any questions you may have. They are, not only are they representing and marketing the programs, but they've actually processed some of these loans so they can they have the experience to uh, to help to answer your questions in a much deeper way than you might get at other offices. So thank thank you to them. Um, as I said, we'll just go through a few slides. Next slide, Jim. Okay, so here are the four major programs, and they're kind of in order of how we laid them out um, in terms of the impact. So, paycheck protection uh, program, of course, those numbers are huge. We needed to use the lenders to, to, to make that program work and get it out quickly. Um, and uh, it works a little bit like uh, the guarantee program uh, in that we're using the bank's money up front and then paying off any, uh, any forgiveness applications that come in. And um, that's a whole other process that we've gone through. And that, pro that process gets easier uh, as, the, uh, as the program moves on. Uh, another program that we have um, as well that was laid out in, in the various bills was the debt relief program. And that was anyone that had a 7A or 504 program uh, or loan, um, depending on when you received it, the, the government and SBA provided direct payments of principal and interest, uh, sometimes up to six months, sometimes up to eight months, depending on the type of business you are. So that, that's helped out as well. Idle's been mentioned several times as long as well as uh, targeted uh, the advance under idle. And we'll mention that. And then last but not least, the shuttered venue program that we will um, mention as well. And that's a grant for um, those of you that are involved with theaters and other live acts. Next one. Okay. Um, 
so PPP, what, what is it? It's a, it's a rollout of um, existing loan funds. Um, and it's based on, and this is a question that we had a lot, is how much can I get or how much should I apply for? It's actually based upon your monthly average. So it's two and a half times monthly average payroll. Um, there's no requirement for collateral personal guarantees. And um, if the only, the only caveat to this is you have to use it for protection program. And this was, I mean, to protect paychecks. In other words, retain employees. This was kind of the beauty of this program. Uh, you know, in, in discussions and in sidebars, we're talking with the, the, the senator staff here, um, the idea of this was, well, we could have given a bunch, bunch of money to unemployment um, as people went on unemployment, but instead we decided to give it to small businesses with, which will retain employees. And this is kind of a killing two birds with one stone and um, very innovative. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who came up with this concept. You know, we'll give full, full credit to Senator Carper on it, but, or Senator Coons on it, I should say. Um, but it, it really has laid out pretty well and um, I think saved a lot of small businesses. So you'll find that. Uh, let's see what else we have. So as long as you use 60% of the, the funds for payroll, you, uh, you will receive full forgiveness uh, for the program itself. All of the forgiveness applications come through your lender. Uh, and as well as the loan applications come through your lender. So that's uh, part of the program. And then um, there's no fees on it. There's no prepayment penalty. If you, for some reason, have a um, part that's not forgiven, then that would turn into a five-year loan at 1% interest. Um, and, and if it's before June 20th, it's a two-year loan. Uh, June 5th, 2020, it's a two-year loan. Next slide. Okay, so there's two parts to this program. Uh, there's what we call the first draw, and it uh, it it's, has different uh, parameters to it. So, first draw is still available. Uh, now, this is sorry, about that. that's a date that's out of out of date. Um, March 31st has been extended, as the senator said, to June 30th. So we're in good shape there. Um, you can also increase your PPP loan on the first draw. One of the changes that they made uh, for first draw, instead of eight weeks, you can go as far as 24 weeks to use the money. Some of that was based on feedback that we received, uh, that it was too short of a time period to use the funds. Uh, and you must have been in business before February of uh, 2020, February 15th of 2020. Next one, Jim. So eligibility under first draw, and why we're mentioning this is because first draw is still available if someone has not received a first draw. So we can kind of turn back time and, and, and look at 2020 as if you're getting your first draw PPP. Uh, so if you haven't received one, the, the window did not close. We opened it back up again, and um, we made some others that were not eligible, and this was a big one, the, the third point down, the 50C. Uh, 501c6 organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, they are eligible now. So um, that was a big change we heard for a while and, um, and Congress reacted and made that change to it. Um, sole proprietor was another big change that was made recently. Uh, anyone that files under Schedule C now can, uh, we've made changes to that to have them now qualify for a lot more money. So um, 501c3s and others have always been eligible. Next one, Jim. Okay, so Congress created this part, which I think was very innovative as well. So the first draw came out and it was available to anyone that had a business that qualified. You didn't have to call, you didn't even have to say you were gonna be affected, we didn't know. Um, but when second draw came out, there was some parameters put on it. So you had to have received a first draw, obviously. And then, um, you had to show at least 25% reduction in uh, a quarter in order to qualify for this uh, second draw. Um, so the maximum loan for this is uh, uh, two and a half times the average payroll, but there was a, there's a caveat in there. If you are in what's called the 72 series uh, for your NAICS code, food service, as well as some others, um, you are at three and a half times your payroll. Uh, so you'll find that that is um, helped out a lot of restaurants in, uh, and hospitality, especially in um, Southern Delaware. 
Uh, let's see. So one of the one of the things for, in order to get a second draw, you must show that you're going to reuse the first draw, um, which is um, available. Um, the form online to check that is uh, we have government form 2483, and that will tell you whether or not um, you're using your correct uh, your first draw correctly. Next one, Jim. Second draw, um, I mentioned most of these eligibilities. There was a change in, in small, um, the size standard. You could see there the second point. Instead of 500 employees, you have to have less than 300 employees. Um, that was a change that was made. It didn't affect a lot of people, but uh, it certainly started to bring down um, the size of the loans that we did. And um, I think that was a welcome change. Um, and I already mentioned the other points as well. Next one, Jim. Uh, so here are the takeaways, um, the expanded eligibility, the changes on the, uh, on the uh, pay period or the covered period, um, the second draw uh, helps the hardest small businesses, hardest hit small businesses, and there's some deductions that can be changed um, that were allowed um, that were not allowed under the first uh, version of this program. The numbers are there, 86% of PPP loans were less than 150000 and then this was a big change. No, you no longer have to re, uh, decrease the PPP loan amount by the idle advance, which I think was huge, especially for the smaller businesses. Next one, Jim. So I mentioned PPP, I mentioned um, 504 and 7A payments. There, by the way, there are no fees for the 504 and 7A loans for the rest of the fiscal year, September 30th. Uh, and um, so if you, if you apply for those, there'll be no fees for those. And that's, that can be significant because they run between two and three and a half percent. So there's, there's uh, lots of changes um, that were here to help small businesses uh, with the guarantee fees. Idle, um, now idle is a whole different ball game. Idle economic injury disaster loan. Now that program has been around for many, many years. It's usually used for disasters like fires, floods, hurricanes, that kind of thing. However, um, idle for national disasters was put in place. Uh, last time it was done was uh, under 9-11. And of course we reactivated it for COVID. Uh, the program has expanded uh, and used like never before uh, to include more businesses. And I mentioned earlier, we had 14 million applications in the first year last year um, at the end of 2020. Uh, there's been several changes to that. We recently re increased the number to 150,000, um, from 150,000 to 500,000, and that I think will help a lot, a lot more small businesses. Another big change to that, instead of looking just uh, six months of operating capital under the program, you can now do 24 months of operating capital under IDLE. So you'll see a lot more small businesses that will receive additional funds under IDLE. That additional funds opens on April 6th, I believe, is the next time you can apply for the additional funds under IDLE if you've already received one and you want to re receive an increase. And then last but not least, April 8th will be the shuttered venue. Operating grant will be available. Um, that is for any theaters, live performances, et cetera. A lot of information on the internet about that. Um, and uh, that grant is coming out. Now that's a tiered system. So if you, you're going to look at the hardest hit operating, um, uh, I should say theaters. Uh, so if you have a 75% reduction or more, you're going to be first in line for that program and then so on. It goes to 50 and then it goes to 25%. So that, that's going to be targeted to the most hard hit um, uh, theaters and live venues. Next one, Jim. Um, I wanted to give my contact information for my entire staff. Uh, they've just been amazing on helping out small businesses directly. Uh, if you have people that have questions about the application, if you're a lender that have questions, uh, we can help you with all that. Um, we even have some temporary people. Rachel Waldini is somebody added on temporary. Um, and other than that, um, I think that's all I wanted to mention in terms of the program. Um, and, I, and I welcome your questions. Hey, John. Is there anything in this? John, Tom Carper, can you hear me? John? Yeah. Can you hear me, bud? Yeah, hold on, we're gonna...
We can hear you, Senator. I think he's uh, just adjusting yeah, something. We, yeah, I need to Not move. shaving, you. are you, John? Um, no. <laughs> Jim, we need to move. Um, so, Jim, can you answer the question real quick? All right. Let me, yeah. Yeah, th th this is about uh, venues, the two uh, theaters, um, music venues, and so forth. Yes, um, sir. Large, large uh, national chains of uh, movie theaters. Are they eligible for that, or is this mostly for the, the local folks? Jim, you're on mute. There we go. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yes, as far as I know, the chains are eligible. They probably are subject to the maximum amounts they can receive. Uh, and it depends how they're structured. I don't know if they're all corporately owned or if some of those are locally owned and their own entity. Uh, each entity would be eligible up to the maximum amount. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, Bruce Rushton here. I'm a local small business owner, also a um, member of the board of the Middletown's Hammer of Commerce. I had a question around the idle loans. And so it's been my understanding that there is some expansion, but I guess I'm, uh, I need to have some clarity around if business owners who've applied and received idle loans in the past, will they have to do something to receive additional funds or is that gonna be an automated, automatic process come April 6th? What's the, what's the criteria? We, we, we don't know exactly what that process will be yet, whether it's automated as you say. I, hints are that you would receive some notification from the SBA automatically, an email asking if you want to increase, but that's not etched in concrete yet. Uh, we just don't know. It's, uh, we'll see in the next uh, couple of weeks what the exact process is. This is Kay Wheatley from Rehoboth Dewey Chamber. And I'm just wondering, do the venues that were really hurt by business with weddings being canceled and different entertainment things, do they qualify? They typically do not. And John, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it needs to be a theater, movie theater, live theater, that type of venue where uh, live theater is the majority of their income. So a country club that occasionally rents for a wedding probably does not qualify. Again, there's a webinar coming up hosted by SBA to answer more detailed questions about that. Uh, you can find that information. We may be able to give it at the end of this presentation, but you can also find it at sba.gov. It's a national webinar to uh, discuss more about the application process that should open in the next week or so and maybe more details about exactly who will be eligible. But as it stands right now, they probably are not. Even if it's like a hotel, that that's a major part of their business. Well, it's probably not 70% of their business. Okay. It's probably hotel receipts or their, okay. is their normal income. Hey John, John Tom Carper again. We, uh, you've mentioned and Chris has mentioned a number of the changes we've made to the program as we've gone along in response to comments from uh, businesses and, and frankly from the SBA and your team. What are there any changes that we have not addressed in, the, in this most recent uh, legislative package that we passed that we still need to act on? Well, I mean, there could be, you know, there's folks that are asking for. Um, a higher a higher number for forgiveness you know if it's two million dollars or less um just to give a little history it started out as fifty thousand dollars you didn't really need to show a lot of documentation sba would go ahead and forgive it you, you signed a bunch of certifications then congress moved it up to 150 thousand um and there's there's one of the changes that i keep hearing about is we'd love to see that jump up to two million there's got to be this balance, though, as you all know, between taxpayer dollars and 
making sure they're using them correctly. So that, that was one of the changes that I think um, is being pushed um, by small business owners. Um, and uh, I, I've had several questions about the idle, idle um, cap. So right now it bumped up to 500,000. It was at 150,000. Normal, normally idle's at 2 million per person. Uh, per business, I should say. So um, a lot of folks would like to see that go to 2 million. And, ju and just so we understand, uh, idle is a loan. So I mean, it has to be paid back within, you have up to 30 years, but it's it's a pretty good interest rate at 2.75 or 3.75. So Senator, I would say that would be the two um, that I would, that I see out there in here, but welcome to any suggestions from the audience about any other changes. Okay, thanks, John. Anybody else? One question I have, and I'm not sure if it falls under this category, but the employment uh, employee retention tax credit, my understanding, and I'm not saying I understand it correctly, is that once things open up, you're no longer eligible. But what happens or some of the businesses in our chamber are concerned that like if the state opens, but there's still say the six feet requirement for distancing for tables, then they still can't get to 100% capacity. So are they disqualified because technically the state's open? Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a uh, expert on the uh, employee retention tax credit. It's more of an IRS issue. Jim, Jim, did you have any comment on that one or? Not really, I'd ask your CPA or a CPA. I, I don't think there's been any guidance on that. Senator Coons. David Brown is on the call from my DC office and I'm not sure if he's got um, any specific insight. Kay, you're asking uh, a question that is soon gonna become relevant um, when um, states like Delaware get to a point in terms of how many people are vaccinated that we're seriously discussing reopening. Uh, I don't see David on this call. There's just a placeholder. So if, if I can find someone who can answer that, uh, we'll try and get back to you. Okay, I can there's offer there's you eight. Thanks, Senator Coons. And um, yes, that's a question we can we could get an answer for you. So um, if you would uh, send me your email in the chat, we'll make sure to follow up. Okay. Hi, this is Judy with the Central Delaware Chamber. We had asked that question too, and what we had heard, and again, you know, what you hear <laughs> is that as long as there were some type of restriction in place, so if the social distance was still in place, that would be considered a restriction. So therefore it could still be, they would still be considered under restriction, which would not eliminate their being able to have that retaining of employees. That's what we were told early on. So I'm not sure how accurate it is, but that's what we were told. Okay. Good question. So I have, this is Bruce again with the Middletown Chamber. I have one more question. It's not related to SBA stuff, but maybe someone on the call could answer this. You know, a lot of our members of the chamber down here and businesses that I interact with are having a hard time uh, hiring. Mm -hmm. And whether it's real or perceived, they're still blaming it on the extended unemployment dollars and things like that. Has there been uh, anything that we're doing or anything that's been done to kind of address that or at least help them alleviate this and try, and try to get some more employees uh, hired? No, let me, this is Tom Carpenter. Let me take a shot at that. When we were negotiating the, uh, the, the last package, the $1.9 trillion package, a uh, group of uh, centrist uh, Democrats pushed uh, pretty hard to provide a, uh, a phase down and phase out of the extended uh, federal and extended unemployment benefits. And one of the proposals that I, I thought uh, made uh, a fair amount of sense, I thought it was humane, but uh, would be to uh, stay at uh, $300 a week until I think the end of May, and then to step it down to $200 a week till the end of July, and then uh, th keep it at $100 a week until the end of the fiscal year, September 30th. And uh, and if 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 it, uh, we got to the end of September and the all hell broke loose and the economy hasn't taken off like I think a lot of us expect us to, then we can make adjustments in. But I, I thought the idea of a phase down and phase out 
would uh, be, would be uh, would a smart thing to do. Didn't have the support for doing it, and uh, so we didn't do it. Is there anything in the works that would allow for that? And the other thing I will add to the gentleman's question, here at the beach, we are having some major, major problems with getting employees. And the other thing that's playing into it are the J-1 students. And I know the um, Jersey delegation has sent a letter to President Biden asking for the Proclamation 10052 to be rescinded, which affects the J-1s. But the other problem they're having is getting, um, getting appointments at their embassy to get their visa to come here. And then in addition to that, they have to have housing. And that's the other thing that the employers are running into here because of what the real estate market, I mean, it's great that it's booming, but it's really limiting the number of options for being able to provide housing. And it has to kind of be in the area because the transportation, they don't have a car. So they're, they're bikers. And if they go too far away, then you run into weather and some of the transportation, the hours that are provided don't really allow for their working hours. So it's a, it's a major, major issue. Karen yeah. McGrath, Karen McGrath, who's actually suggested we have this uh, event today. I used to be uh, the director of the chamber, one of the chambers down in, in Sussex County along the yeah, beach. Definitely Fenwick. And, uh, and Karen, Karen, any thoughts in response to Kate's question or comments? Um, so a lot of this is not, is not new, but I, I agree with, um, with Kay that certainly the real estate market here at the, the beach, um, has houses that have rented for years. And then over the past couple of months, you've got multiple, um, uh, cash offers on a house and they're selling for way over what they're, they're listed at. Um, I know that, that our office has worked with a number of, of businesses, both agriculture related and, um, and other businesses to try to get their summer workers here, whether they're coming on here on an H2A or an H2B or, um, or J1. And I agree with Kay that there have been some problems where there are some American embassies around the world that are still not doing in-person appointments. Um, and we have travel bans from some countries such as South Africa, but uh, seasonal workers are um, exempted from a lot of those uh, travel bans. So uh, we are getting some of the, the workers here and, and I, I, don't, I don't disagree with Kay. We're, we're looking like um, we're gonna have a really good season this year and, and we're gonna have to make our own drinks because we're just not gonna have enough people here um, to do it, but we'll, we'll do the, the best we can. I, I don't know um, if there's some creative way that the Department of Labor could um, help out with some job training, getting people who have been unemployed for a good amount of time, getting people who maybe have, have a disability into some sort of um, work programs here for some of the entry level positions. Okay, I'm well aware of the issues you've raised about the J-1 and the executive order, and I have raised those uh, with the White House uh, and with the Department of Labor. I don't know if they'll work through them in time um, for the in-person interviews, the recruitment, the placement. Um, Karen just spoke to the housing and transportation issues. Um, there is a bipartisan conversation going on about longer term uh, reform to H-2As. I'm trying to get J-1s into that conversation as well, but um, I recognize we're gonna, hopefully we're gonna have a labor shortage um, that becomes challenging because we're gonna be reopened and we're gonna have a robust summer. And um, we already have the, the labor shortage. One of the businesses I was talking to had to reduce their hours because of lack of help, the equivalent of 43 business days over the last year. Over the last year. And, you know, it's really, they, the businesses are really struggling because they just can't get the help. Part of it Part of the solution could be the J-1. The other thing that we're running into is they can't get information from the State Department about what they are required to do if they do get students or J-1 students. Um, so if there's any way you guys could help with 
trying to get the State Department, they won't even return calls. So if you can try to help with getting the State Department, you know, do they have to be quarantined for two weeks? Do they, what do they have to do? What can't they do? And is it okay if I send um, both the Senator some information out of Jersey where Senator sure. Booker and Mendez have sent um, a letter and done a press release that maybe we could ask you guys to kind of do the same thing? No, that'd be good. Okay. No, thanks. Karen, would you just follow up on that with, uh, with Kay, please? Thank you. So, so we have uh, Tyler Aiken on the call. He's a restaurateur. He wanted to ask a question. Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, so I realize I'm rereading this and uh, there isn't actually a question, but I, I'll, I'll pose the question. Um, you know, we expect these, these restaurant relief funds for which we're incredibly grateful. And both of our senators were, were co-sponsors on, on the bill when it was moving as an independent, you know, as, as, a, as a standalone measure. Um, just for everybody's context, uh, you know, this was, this was passed, like Senator Coons mentioned at the beginning of the call, in reconciliation. Um, we, we do expect the funds to fly out the door. And, um, you know, we, my question is, can we count on you, um, our legislators, to support a replenishment of this program when, when uh, it's depleted quickly? Chris, do you have any idea when it might be depleted? I, I do not. Do you know? I don't. I don't have an estimate of how quickly um, that will run. Um, as uh, is well known to Tyler and others, uh, certainly John, um, the Small Business Committee, uh, when the first PPP um, got you know, just sort of overwhelmed with applicants and ran out fairly quickly, we both extended it uh, and further funded it. Um, the broad bipartisan support, uh, actually, I shouldn't say that, the broad support for restaurants um, is something that I hope we'll see extended. Part of our challenge here is um, in how many more times we're going to be able to do big uh, bold funding bills. Uh, there may only be one more this year. We'll see. Um, so my hope, I will certainly, I will certainly support continued funding for um, restaurant and venue grants. Uh, and my hope is we'll have the vehicle and the opportunity to do so. Thank you, Tyler. Any other questions? Or just comments. You don't have to ask a question, just a comment. John, this is Karen. I'm I'm just wondering if the um the the group of chamber leadership that we have here on the phone, um uh do you feel that uh, you as your own organization and your membership um understands the um the PPP loan forgiveness process? And if not, could um, could John just maybe run through the steps of of that? Because I've had some questions from people about it. Yeah, that'd be good. Would you, John? You're muted, John. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. <laughs> On the um, forgiveness process, so there's been. Let's see. Oh, Jim's going to bring it up. There's a there. This is on our website, um, but I could go over that as well. So there, th there's a form here for the fill out. But most of the time, uh, what I tell people about the forms is the, the the form is there for informational purposes, just to let you know what questions you're going to be asked. Because 99% of the lenders are, are are fully online. They're going to have a platform for you to use a portal, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so the process is this, once, once you have identified your covered period, use the funds in, in the way that needed to be used. Again, the 60-40 split, 60% 60 for payroll, 40% for other uses. Uh, you then contact your lender and they will put you through the uh, portal for forgiveness. So, there are different levels though. So if you are at 150,000 or below, there's a certification that you sign and uh, you see a copy of it up here. Um, 
but it's basically, you don't have to show documentation. You sign these different boxes, uh, which basically says you used it in a way that was in accordance to the law. And uh, your lender submits this information to SBA. These are the easy ones. 86% of all loans that were forgiven came through this way. The other uh, above that, 150,000 uh, or more, uh, then you go through a little bit different process. The form's a little longer. Uh, I don't know if we have that, Jim, if we had that one. But again, there's a form on there for above 150,000. And, and that point, someone at SBA will review those. Um, and as was said earlier, we're trying to stand up these programs quickly. We're using a lot of temp employees. Jim's going to bring this up. Um, we're using a lot of temp employees. So if it's 150,000 or more, the form will be a little longer. You'll have to show some documentation to your lender and then the lender will submit for, uh, for forgiveness. Now, the, the lender receives those funds directly from the SBA, which they put into your account, uh, and then you're off and running. If there's a balance that we decided was not eligible for forgiveness, again, you'll pay that off over the next five years. Um, yeah, so our instruction, I mean, our websites are really good about that. Um, the ones that are taking the longest are the ones that are 2 million and above. And uh, they're taking, because we have a person going through each, each of those as well. So um, that is taking the longest. And you can imagine the millions that we're getting uh, are on there. Most of these are automated forgiveness. They're going through quickly. Uh, last I saw, we still had about, uh, about 90,000 in the queue. Um, and that's almost on a daily basis. So, um, Forgiveness is through there. Now, the, one of the things that um, the agency did say, and some lenders have been frustrated, the, the small business, by holding up forgiveness or uh, not opening the portal. Uh, maybe they're handling some of the larger loans first for forgiveness, whatever it may be. If you find a problem with your lender, contact us directly. At, at our office, or you can send an email to our credit risk management people. It's OCRM at SBA.gov. So OCRM at SBA.gov. And they handle the lenders in terms of the way they handle borrowers. They review the lenders, re review how they, their practices are, and they make sure that you're being treated fairly when it comes to not only, not only PPP loans, but any of our loan programs. So OCRM is a direct line to the SBA headquarters uh, and they will, they will contact your lender on their behalf. And believe me, nobody wants to get a call from those folks um, because they can take them out of the program if they have to. <laughs> so. so John, what's showing on the screen now is applicable to businesses that received more than 150,000 and it is more complicated requires more calculations and certification. The first form I showed was for businesses that the PPP loan was under 150,000 and it's very simple. You just have two certifications that you use the money properly uh, for the reasons that are approved, sign it, it's an affidavit. You don't have to provide any documentation with it unless the bank asks you for something. Uh, 940, 941s uh, to document your payroll. So this one, this longer one, only applies if you got over 150,000. Right, right. Thank you, Jim. So you'll see the account. Now, if you, the other tip we have too, is you look out on the um, uh, different sources, not SBA, we don't have an automatic, um, let me bring that back up. We don't have an automatic platform to do the calculations for you, but there are several out there on the internet that have used the SBA form and it will, you plug in the numbers using the electronic and it will do the calculations for you. Of course, you're going to want to, you know, your banker will want to review that with you before they submit it to SBA. Um, but it, so you don't have to necessarily do it manually using our forms. You can use an outside source. Um, 
and then they'll send you, you know, a bunch of emails trying to sell you something. But it, I've, I've had people use those as well, um, and they've worked out pretty well. Good question, you know. Thank you, Karen. Well, one additional question around uh, PPP forgiveness: Is there a time frame for this second draw forgiveness, or is that just basically dependent upon the lender uh, setting those portals up? Well, it's, it's, uh, I believe it's, is it 10 weeks after they receive the funds on the second draw? That's when your time period can start. Right. And then it can go for 24 weeks, any 20, any 10 week period within the next 24 weeks, I think, or no, actually that's not quite right. You, you get to choose the time period you want up to 24 weeks. Right. But the idea have, is to do it as quickly as possible. Get it? As soon as you expend the money for the purposes allowed, file for forgiveness. Get it done. Wash your hands of it. And it's it's done. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking of along those lines. And I guess, you know, uh, the businesses I talk to, I guess I just need to direct them to contact their lenders to see if they're actually processing those second draw forgiveness um, uh, applications. But, Probably not yet. There hasn't been time to use the money for most of the folks because that started, what, early January? Mm -hmm. I don't even think they're past the 10-week point yet. But as soon as they are, yes, submit for forgiveness. Let's see. Do we have any more questions in the chat? I would just like to clarify I think somebody said that 501c6s, meaning for the chambers, they are eligible for all these packages now? Yes, that was a recent change. Okay. Yes, Kay, we fought particularly hard for that one. Trust me, I heard from a lot of you about this issue, and I raised it and raised it and pushed it and pushed it, and we ultimately got it done, but um, it, that was not easy. Yes, that's in the latest bill. Thank you, Chris. This part of the poem has been named after you, Kay. <laughs> yeah, that was huge. That was thank huge. you all very, very much for doing that. Um, because, as you know, one of our reasons for asking for that is one of the ways that we really have, like, our incomes are split into three divisions our membership, our publications, and events. And we really have been shut down on the event side. So, a good majority of us as Chambers of Commerce, you know, we're we're definitely uh, just treading water at this point and we're trying to work our way around things as best we can. So being able to get the PPP was huge for us. And uh, to be quite frank, it, it saved us. So thank you very, very much for your help. Thank you. Hey, and I'd like to mention that if any of you want a, a similar webinar for your members, I've done that for many of you. I'll be welcome to do it for any of you that want to do it again or that want to do it for the first time. We'll be happy to do that because it's uh, really a shame the number of small businesses, probably a lot of your members have not participated yet. And the PPP is converts 100% to a grant in most cases. So even if it's only five or 10,000 or 100, thousands, hundreds of thousands. It's definitely worth the 30 minutes it takes to complete the application, or even if it's a couple hours. That's so please Jim, encourage your folks to do that. Thank you so much. Jim, this is Roxanne with the Middletown Chamber. Yes, hi Roxanne. I just, I just, how are you doing? Thank you. I just wanted to share that we would love to host one of those again. Um, we just had a very successful job fair today in Middletown, and a few of the businesses asked if the PPP had been extended. And we said that we believe it had been through June 30. Mm -hmm. um, so we would love to host another one of those because there's several that did not take advantage the first time. Right. Okay. So if we yeah, can get I'll, one of those on, I'd be happy to. Since, since you're in Newcastle, I'll check with Ellen and perhaps she and I okay. both do it together. But yep, we'll, I'll uh, let her take the lead on that. Uh, but we'll be Thank glad to do it. Thank you very kindly. You bet. Thank you very kindly. Yes, ma'am. So, um, one of the things I wanted to mention, we were on a, a national call on Monday with um, some of the new leadership that came in with uh, President Biden's administration. Um, the the shuttered venue grant was was new for us. We we were supposed to have it out quickly within within you know two weeks maybe. 
and we're coming up on three months and finally we're going to get it out. And it, it, part of it is, is the agency trying to stand up a new, a new program. Um, so we, we heard that from you, your constituents, uh, your members as well, and that, that we need to be more efficient. So what they've told us now is when the restaurant program comes out, um, we learned a lot of lessons from that and they expect it'll come out a lot quicker. Um, so we, we, we learned our lessons and, and believe me, it's, it's going to come out quicker. They've handled it um, uh, with a different department within SBA. Uh, and I think you'll find that a lot of your members will be interested in that and that will be out uh, very shortly here. So uh, stay tuned for that and um, let us know if there's any changes that we need to make for that as well. Any other questions? Let's see, I'm gonna look in the chat room. Jim, is there anything that you wanted to mention that we didn't cover? Uh, no, I think we're good. I don't see anything else in the chat room. Well then let me uh, I'm, close this I'm, out if I might, uh, Jim and John, um, Senator Carper and all the chambers and thank you for your partnership. Um, this has been recorded uh, and if there was a question you wanna go back and uh, see differently or you want to uh, send your members, uh, members of the different chambers, uh, a link. It's going to be up on my YouTube channel, uh, which is on youtube.com at Senator Chris Coons. Uh, and obviously, um, our SBA office does a great job and uh, they're available to you. Um, there's lots of information uh, under the frequently asked questions section of uh, my Senate website, but also the SBA, sba.gov, and John and Jim uh, have offered repeatedly to do a customized presentation for your members. So uh, let's give uh, our friends from SBA just a quick round of applause to thank them all. Um, and thank you for everything you as Chambers of Commerce are doing uh, to help Delaware's uh, small businesses, nonprofits, uh, whether they're in tourism, hospitality, restaurant, restaurants, or other small businesses of all kinds um, to get through this. Uh, we will get through all this together. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you guys for what you're doing. Bye, everybody. Good luck. God bless. Thanks, everyone. Take Thank care. You. Thank you.